I grew up not nurturing fantasies of a white wedding, a picket fence, and happily ever after, but instead with an established presumption that I would never get married or have kids. I was wrong on both counts. I've always maintained, even before I was able to rationalize my attitude about it, that it's kind of odd the way our culture sets us up for marriage. Two people, often still in the toddlerhood of their lives, and by that I mean twenties, um, decide to partner forever with a person that they truly believe they will always love, or at least will always remain committed to. Always. And Sometimes, and for most people, this always time frame translates into 50, 60, sometimes even 70 years. Now, only 100 years ago, the lifespan of a human being was around 50 years. So getting married young, it didn't constitute such a long-term commitment. In fact, people got married in their teens back then, but even still, they were only looking at like 30-odd years together. <laughs> That's still a fucking long time. <laughs> the church claims to hold ownership over the construct of marriage. Which is why, in its current state, it excludes a sizable segment of the population. The discriminating purveyors of the current marriage decree have marginalized an important set of people, gays, lesbians, and trans folk, who are not only deserved of the right to pledge their love, but should also be entitled to the exact same benefits that taking that pledge garners their heterosexual counterparts. <laughs> the fact that our culture continues to proclaim marriage's powerful credibility to the degree that we limit access to its advantages is downright laughable. At least it would be if it weren't so fucked up. The fact is that everyone, Everyone should be given the opportunity, to, the opportunity to design their relationships according to the specifications of those involved. All should be authorized to draw up their very own relationship plans and put them into action. So that's what we did. Now, no one sat Scott and me down before our wedding day or at any point during our marriage and said, hey, listen up, you two. One day you will both come to the important realization that you can't, won't, and really shouldn't be everything to each other. Know this, because you'll drive yourselves fucking nuts attempting to fulfill that obligation. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm pessimistic. Although, I like to believe in this case, at least, that I'm realistic. But it has just never seemed very practical, not to mention possible, that we pick one person out of the colossal multitudes to partner with and expect that it will be anything anything less than motherfucking hard. <laughs> I know life is difficult. I mean, I've understood that concept for a very long time, and it's not just me. I mean, everyone has a comprehension of the fact that by virtue of our simple humanity, we will experience pain, heartache, trauma. But that leads to a very important question. Why make it more difficult? by tying ourselves to just one important person for the rest of our lives. Well, the fact is that most of us don't. Most of us collect people along our way, along our journeys. And as we do, we discover that we each have these really important functions. Each of the, these people helps us witness life's beauty, acknowledge our own happiness, and evade the damages that have been inflicted upon us. These are their roles. The people we gather into our lives, they're our teachers, and we're theirs. We learn as infants to cling to people, situations and things, not just for function and survival, but also for comfort and wisdom. Our mothers, bottles, blankets, little stuffed animals, warm baths. In adolescence, we, we trade those symbols of soothing for books, friends, hobbies, computers, masturbatory missions, <laughs> cars and clothes. We get older, and as we do, we require even more stuff. Different scenarios and more people to ameliorate inevitable hurts from our past. The ones that were, at the time, assisted by the soft cushioning of the comforting items of our former lives. Jobs, food, lovers, porn, spouses, sex, status, 
lives, faster cars, cooler clothes, better friends. And as we get older, these things become conduits, not just for comfort and wisdom, but also for function and survival. But it's only temporary. All of it. Just temporary. Yet, sometimes we forget this fleetingness when we marry, entering instead into a partnership that become, becomes restrictive and limiting and one that resembles, dare I say, property ownership more than anything else. But really, why invest in an emotionally bilateral sole proprietorship when it could be an opportunity for freedom finding? This tenet of ownership is synonymous with traditional marriage. It's acknowledged, and not so very subtly, in the vows to have and hold. When we announce that we will have and hold someone until death, we are conveying a pretty powerful message to him and her, as well as to those who bear witness, that in the relationship there exists a paradigm of ownership. And what always attaches to that ownership thing about people is jealousy. Jealousy is, for many people, the big stumbling block of open marriage. In fact, it is in any marriage or intimate relationship. Um, jealousy can be a viscerally ingrained emotion that rears its ugly green head even when we beg it not to. I'm not an unjealous person. Whether or not my jealousy is a learned behavioral response, I don't know. Some people are very fortunate uh, not to have been born with a jealous gene. But jealousy is so programmed or ingrained uh, within so many of us, and certainly within my psyche, and it's so weighted inside of our consciousness that our bodies respond with these unwarranted fears, soaring blood pressure and extreme heart pal palpitations. But I'm here to tell you it can be overcome. You wanna know how? How? The same way that any unsolicited emotional response is subjugated. With training. <laughs> so when Scott and I opened up our marriage, in preparation for hearing about all of his sexual encounters because I wanted to know what he was doing with other women. I spent an inordinate amount of time envisioning him fucking other women. So yeah, I would create these elaborate snapshots in my mind of him fucking up these other women. Yeah, and so in these pseudo fantasies, I could hear the woman's moans. I would carefully conjure Scott's grunts and his thrusts into her. And when they were done, which in my mind was a much shorter length of time than likely would have been in real life, <laughs> I could practically feel him come. And in doing this, and just by simply engaging in this fantasy about my husband fucking someone else, my heart would race, my temperature would rise, and I'd feel really sick to my stomach. But mostly, I would be seized ripped, like headlocked by an overwhelming fear that ultimately drove all the sensations I was experiencing. The fear that I was going to lose my husband. My adverse reaction to the notion of Scott fucking another woman were steeped in this realization, which helped me when I considered my reactive jealousy to discover that it was just a concept. It was a story that I created. And one whose force was, once I figured it out, pretty easily reconciled. You know, stories only have as much power as we give them. So I decided that this story about my jealousy was just something I didn't want any part in writing. And when I let go of it, I was able to see that my fear wasn't altogether rational. Although it wasn't totally irrational either because I can't predict Scott's future behavior. He may very well leave me, but I don't have any control over that. Not really. But I could see how I was holding my fear tightly as if relinquishing it would cause me great harm. And I figured that I feared that I could at any moment lose my husband to someone else with a tighter pussy, a thinner waist, <laughs> flirtier smile, or a better sense of humor, simply because he was fucking her. Um, you know, this scared me. It scared the shit out of me. Why did I feel this way? Because that's what I had been taught to feel. Despite the fact that I had eschewed the traditional marriage par paradigm culture from a very early age, I still managed to believe that as a result of this monogamous one person for everyone culture, that sex and relationships and sexual relationships equal proprietorship, which translated into Scott belongs to me and I belong to him. 
And if he was fucking someone else, then that meant he didn't belong to me. But really, Scott doesn't belong to me. Regardless of whom he is or isn't fucking. He's just on loan. <laughs> I don't own Scott. I don't even own my fucking couch, not really. <laughs> my couch just exists to keep my ass comfy for a while until I tire of it or it gets too ready. Right now, it's holding up pretty well, the couch, even after 10 years. And the same could be said for my car, my clothes, and even Scott. And he's actually very much better than the couch. We don't hold ownership over our daughter. She's a unique person with her own life. We're just here to help her make it to adulthood safely with as little suffering as possible, um, which is, you know, an arduous task in itself, and uh, with as much love as we can possibly provide. Now, personally, I can't lay claim to any of the other lovers I've had in the past or will ever have in the future. I mean, they don't exist solely for me, just as I don't for them. Although, we might determine that existing at the same time together and naked would be a lot of fun. But learning to realize that I don't own these people or these things, that they're just temporary fixtures, allows me to really appreciate them and be grateful for their presence and thankful for those fabulous gifts they bring. It also means that I'll be better able to let them be and do who they are, what they're meant to be and do. And my guess is that one of the things that they're meant to do um, is teach me some things about myself. And that's pretty fucking cool. But, you know, jealousy just gets in the way of that. So. If I relinquish ownership, I relinquish control over the person. And with that, I can let go of that jealousy that I feel, which is just a manifestation of fear. And this, the, you know, it brings a really cool piece to the relationship that's valuable, nurturing, and ultimately sustaining. And an added bonus to this feeling of contentment and release from control is a lack of burden of responsibility, which always comes attached to that ownership thing. And ultimately, I'm rewarded by the opportunity to observe the people, things, and situations, and all their infinite evolutions for as long as I'm, al I'm allowed, even if it's only temporarily. I didn't learn all this shit immediately. <laughs> no, right the contrary, actually, as evidenced by how I reacted to seeing Jasmine and Scott fucking, which is another chapter wherein I freak the fuck out after I see my husband fucking another woman, even though I knew they were fucking. I had to be confronted with jealousy on many occasions before I could understand its power and strip it away. But as my observations of these concepts have been a winding journey, so too has been my path to overcoming my jealousy. But, you know, still, sometimes I veer off course. Thank you. The rest of this book is for sale over at the merch table for $15. And I'll happily sign copies for anybody who wants to.